Hello, and welcome to Songs for the Struggling Artist, the blogcast. This is episode 146. I have been uploading the previous, earliest blogcasts. Um, I feel like I've gotten up to the 17th episode, I think. Although you may, if you are watching closely, you may see that there are a few missing, too, at this point. And I, I, I think they just may be lost to time because I cannot find them anywhere. Um, it is, I, I don't know what happened. I, I really don't. There's no episode 11 and there's no episode 16, I believe. And uh, for whatever reason, I don't know whether I was just like deleting things once I'd uploaded them to SoundCloud. I don't do that. I don't. I, I think I, I realized that, that that was not a good idea or something. I, I actually really have no idea what happened to those two episodes um, or what they were even. Uh, so if you have early, early episodes and they include episode 11 or 16, do let me know and maybe send them on to me so I can share them with others because I... I I don't, maybe I just misnamed them so I can't find them in the files. They're not where they usually go. I have no idea. It's really, I spent much too long looking for episode 11 and I, I, I finally had to give up. Um, I think I gave up on 16 a lot more quickly than I did on 11 because I was like, I don't know. I've already gone down this road <laughs> and there's nowhere else it could be as far as I know. Anyway, so who knows what those, I'm sure they were the most brilliant episodes I ever did, and we are all missing them. I'm very sorry. <laughs> but they, I will continue to upload those, so if you are interested, curious uh, to hear the earlier episodes, they are not from so long ago. They are from what feels like a, a, a more innocent, nicer time, because it was 2016, which is not technically that long ago, but it feels like a lifetime, given all that's happened um, in the world since then. Uh, but yes, so far I have I've gotten up to 17, and I will keep uploading them. The only thing that's a bummer about about uploading them is that the way Anchor tracks listens, it it tells me the average number of listeners per episode. So the more episodes I add. The, the, the more that number just goes down. And I, I like to see it go up. <laughs> but I can actually just look at the total number of downloads. And that, that number is much better. Uh, it's just funny. that I'm like, sometimes I'm like, I'm, I think I'm going to wait because I don't want to watch that, no, that number go down too much today. Um, yeah. So, but if, if, check those out. I feel like in those earlier days... Also, I was doing mostly my own songs, um, so you can hear some more Bright Red Boot songs, some more songs uh, of mine, um, not so much covers. The covers kicked in once Trump got elected, basically. <laughs> so, um, so if you want to hear more originals, going back to the beginning is probably going to be for you. Um, so today's blog is... Uh, one that did not get a lot of views, I will say, but, um, I was pretty proud of it. So <laughs> I'm very glad to get to share it with you now. And, and it is called The Velvet Rope. After the show, we went to the lobby to wait for the actor to emerge after her performance. The lobby was pretty busy. There seemed to be a little reception in progress, featuring sparkling wine and chocolate. The party was cordoned off with a velvet rope. We were on the other side of the velvet rope. The party, we guessed and later had confirmed, was for donors to the theater. We had been given to understand that the actor would be appearing here eventually. We had been told to look for her here on our side of the rope. As the theater emptied out, only a handful of us stood on the peasant side of the velvet rope. Among us were the actor's family and her friends. You might wonder why we didn't simply unhook the rope from the stanchion and go in. Well, this theater had thought of that, too. 
It was so important to them to maintain the separation between the donor class and us plebeians that they had an intern on duty to police it. He dutifully unhooked the rope to allow donors out and did his best to look forbidding to those of us on the outside. He made it clear that this party wasn't for us and we were not to be included. For a good long while, this theater's lobby featured a small party of about 24 people drinking Prosecco inside a velvet rope and seven people standing around outside it, policed by an intern and his boss. The party proceeded like this for some time. That is, until I spotted and made complicitous eye contact with the actor, who, after all, was the woman of the hour, and finally I just unhooked the velvet rope and ran in to give her a hug. Seeing the actor showing me such warmth, the woman in charge of this party, who had clearly found our presence distasteful before, now invited us to eat and drink. We had all been brought inside the rope. There was no one left outside it. I don't know what happened to the actual velvet rope after that. It had been designed to keep the riffraff out, and once the riffraff was inside, there was no purpose for it anymore. As someone now on the inside, the rope was no longer of any concern to me. I expect that to those who had been inside all along, the velvet rope barely registered their attention. Did they know it was there? Once I was inside it, it ceased to be important to me, but before I got inside, that velvet rope and the people policing it were my primary focus. This exercise in absurdity seems to me to be the perfect allegory for the American theater, and maybe for American art in general. The theater, where this happened, states in their mission statement that they seek to create broad public access and to bond the diverse New York community. And yet, with a simple velvet rope and a zealous gatekeeper, they created division and diminished access right there in their very own lobby. It's not just them. This absurdity plays itself out through almost every arts organization in America. A few years before, just down the street from this theater, at another arts organization I used to work for, a crowd of artists sat in the lobby while the party, for us, went on upstairs because the gatekeeper would not let us up. And that's just a literal example. The whole field seems to be arbitrarily divided up by absurd velvet ropes. Once you have been invited inside, you can enjoy the Prosecco and chocolate and opportunities. But when you're outside, you just sort of stand there awkwardly trying to make eye contact with any friends you might have inside. And woe to the person trying to get into the party without any friends inside. Trying to make art in this country is like trying to get inside the velvet ropes without any friends inside. There are multiple forces at work that are actively trying to keep you out. There are things like submission fees, onerous grant application processes, and requirements for references from well-known persons. This is a way to prove you have a contact inside the party. There are ways to increase your chances of getting past the ropes, depending on your field. Getting an MFA might introduce you to an insider. That's indirectly how I met my insider at this donor theater party. Or interning at the right spot might help you rise up the ranks. But your best shot is being born into a social circle or with access to someone who knows someone. And of course, just making it inside the ropes for one day, for one party, won't really help you in the long run. You need to be a regular insider, to become so used to the Prosecco and the chocolate that you don't even notice them at the party. In order to stand a chance of having your art produced, you need to be so far behind the barriers that you forget the velvet ropes entirely. The difference between a struggling artist and one who has made it, lives in those velvet ropes. The struggling artist is acutely aware of where the ropes are and who is guarding them. 
They are, after all, designed to keep us out. In a country that prides itself on its egalitarian values, this exclusion is particularly galling. That is made worse by how easily and quickly the barrier is lifted, and also how entirely unnecessary the barrier is to begin with. There was so much Prosecco and so much food at this donor party that the staff had to take boxes of it home to prevent it being thrown away. That velvet rope made me feel that this theater would rather throw their chocolate away than let me have it. Then I got a nod of approval from an insider, and suddenly I could have all the chocolate I could have wanted. There was no difference in my quality on one side or the other of that rope. I was the same person on both sides of the barrier. Inside, I had approval. Outside, I was a nuisance. It is not nice to feel like a nuisance, and yet, because I am outside the rope most of the time, I do feel it a lot. I made myself go talk to a famous actor recently. While I was telling her how much I admired her work in the show she'd just done, I felt fine. Like the metaphorical velvet rope between us didn't matter at all. But as soon as I tried to hand her the play she'd inspired me to improve and keep going on, I felt the velvet rope pop up. Whether on my side or on hers, it doesn't really matter. The point is, it showed up. I felt like a nuisance and an idiot. The sense of humiliation was profound, even though there was no actual rope. Part of what is so difficult about being a perpetual struggling artist is constantly bumping up against that rope. If you have a well-connected friend or two, you may on occasion find yourself on the other side for a moment. But a well-connected friend will not protect you from all the other velvet ropes that arts organizations put up to keep out the riffraff. At the heart of the velvet rope distinction, it feels like those who are on the inside are just better people. If you're a writer with an agent, then you must be a better writer than one without. If you know a famous person, you must be cooler than your average person. It is not so far from the American sense that money just makes you better. That the rich are rich because they worked hard and deserve it. They're just naturally inside. What's ironic is, I would wager you a bottle of Prosecco that the donors inside the rope don't care a bit about keeping out the riffraff. It is the gatekeepers that are concerned about it. And very concerned they are, indeed. Also, ironically, riffraff-wise, everyone in that lobby with me had a degree of privilege already. The tickets at that theater are quite expensive. So the separation is not between top-hatted, monocled millionaires and fingerless-gloved ragamuffins. It's the difference between someone who can afford to donate a building and someone who can afford to enter it. The riffraff are people who can pay to see esoteric theater for an average price of $75 a ticket. In the case of this theater, with its mission to bring people together, it was a literal velvet rope. But arts organizations put up metaphorical velvet ropes every day. If you run one, look at how and where you put up barriers to access. Anything you put in place to reduce your submissions, for example, that's a velvet rope. Obviously, you can keep it there if you want to, but if you're only including the agented, the recommended, the, the degreed, or the submission feed, you're sending a message that you are only interested in privileged artists that you prefer your donors to your audience, that you only want insiders. Your velvet ropes say that you only want to give that Prosecco to the people who have a case of Prosecco at home. If, like this theater, you aspire to create broad public access and to bond your community, you have to let your velvet ropes go. So, do you know that there are two songs called The Velvet Rope? I did some research and discovered there's one that's kind of a hit 
I guess it was last year, maybe. It's like really current. Uh, but that one was not going to be the right vibe for this post. But the other one is a Janet Jackson song from her album of the self-same name, The Velvet Rope. So um, I have now covered a Janet Jackson song. This is something I did not expect to happen. I would never have predicted. But sometimes this blogcast leads me to very interesting places. I will put that song for you here in just a minute. Meanwhile, um, if you like the podcast and you want to support it, that would be amazing. Uh, like and subscribe on iTunes, I'm told. Some five-star action over there would make a big difference. Um, I don't know. I know it's technically Apple Podcasts, um, but I, I don't know whether you have to go to iTunes in order to rate and... Sub anyway, someone, someone tell me the lingo. Apparently, Apple is very concerned about their branding, and there is a distinction between Apple Podcasts and iTunes. But I think you have to go to iTunes to rate an Apple Podcast. I don't actually know. But if you know, please tell me so I can tell everybody the right, the right thing. I don't want to mess with Apple because, you know, I'm just a struggling artist over here. Um, yeah, so do that if you can, want to. Uh, also, you can support me in the making of this podcast by becoming my patron on Patreon. It's Emily R. Davis is where you will find me there. So patreon.com slash Emily R. Davis. Um, you can do it for as little or as much as you like. And if you're not keen on the pay per blog post model, um, I do have another one set up, although I currently have no patrons on that particular uh, membership model. Um, but if the other way seems too confusing for you, kick it off on that other, on that other thing. Um, I just letting it sit there. It may or may not turn into something, um, but we'll see. Other places you can offer your support are on PayPal, uh, slash struggling artists would be the place to find me there, and on Kofi under my name, Emily Rainbow Davis. So if you have a few dollars to throw my way, it will make a difference. Believe it or not, this uh, blog, podcast, blogcast has made me one dollar and five cents. So, um, I'm not sure I can even say that because I used to be paying for SoundCloud. So that dollar and five cents that I made on advertising briefly um, has not really paid that back yet. Anyway, so it would be great to have this be a not losing money proposition. <laughs> anyway, your support is much appreciated no matter how you provide it just listening is incredibly meaningful to me so whatever you're doing is great keep it up thank you um yeah so the velvet rope uh i i messed around a little bit with this one um i was playing a bit with um a delay um effect on the electric guitar and a lot of reverb, so it's a very echoey situation, um, which actually is a little tricky. <laughs> it's tr uh, anyway, I, I think I, I think it's I think it's fun to to play with, and maybe you will enjoy it as well. Um, I feel like I would maybe with an actual audio engineer want to play with this song in more kind of uh, more more. I would like to play with it more. Um, but as a first draft, I shall give to you Janet Jackson's The Velvet Rope. Feel the 
Sarah.